I think a place of belonging is a place where you can feel safe, seen, and accepted. A lot of times people talk about um, vulnerability and authenticity, like a place where they can really be who they are and feel free from being judged or uh, feeling ashamed or a recrimination of any kind. Having spaces of connection, um, whether it's through the library or any other way is super important and I think in LA being able to help people connect with each other um, that's a really wonderful thing that these clubs and affinity groups do. and say, oh, I didn't know we did that. I said, yes, we do. A lot of us do that. It was unusual to see us doing the sport. And uh, like I say, other divers didn't really acknowledge us. A lot of times, uh, white scuba divers, they see and they'd be like, well, can you swim? Uh, are you going to be all right? You know, that water, you know, stuff like that. Uh, my name is Richard Rice, and I'm currently the president of Los Angeles Black Underwater Explorers. Our mission is to uh, expand the, the knowledge and enjoyment of scuba diving uh, in the, uh, the African-American community. Uh, the club started in, in uh, 1992 as a beach dive club and uh, we started to expand in 1997. This is our 30th anniversary year. The world is covered, what, three quarters by water? All of it that's underwater mostly has not been viewed by man. So I'm among maybe a really minute percentage of humanity that have seen uh, below the surface the beauty of creation that is almost indescribable. The other part of it is because we can travel as a group, we go to places I wouldn't have thought about going. Palau, Malaysia, Fiji, Australia, all through the Caribbean, the ABC Islands, the Dominican, Jamaica, places that maybe I would go, but some other place I wouldn't even think about, places I haven't heard of. When I, for the first 10 years of my time here in Los Angeles, when I moved here, from Tennessee, I didn't know anybody. And uh, I probably would have uh, fallen into the LA lifestyle of uh, discos and going to Vegas for a trip. And, and that's basically what you fall into without some kind of external introduction to the world. So I've traveled the world by myself and I've traveled the world with the buoy. So it, 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 uh, it helped me in a lot of ways to be, become the person that I am and to, to open up to more things. So generally, I think having a, an organization of black scuba divers is important because it helps us to explore and understand our connection to the water and to diving. Um, oftentimes when we're exposed to scuba diving, we just get a general idea of what diving is. Uh, but really having those different nuanced perspectives and telling history of places like Inkwell and our relationship to the water is important. We've been doing a lot of uh, work with shipwrecks, of course, and underwater archaeology, uh, mainly around slave shipwrecks. So we've been going all over the world from Mozambique to South Africa to the Caribbean um, to look for slave shipwrecks and uh, dived on a couple and, and also just working on training archaeology in general and getting regular community members to learn how to do underwater archaeology. You know, I feel that the club is just a good club. It's not even the diving. We do other events besides diving. We have a dive camp weekend in the fall, which I help coordinate. And it, it's really a non-drama, good gathering of professional folks. And I've always enjoyed being a part of Labui. I was telling them today, we're very uh, anxious and looking forward to passing the baton to the next generation. We're not gonna hold on to it. What we want to be sure of is that the club outlives us. We have a Discover uh, Scuba uh, event, and uh, we try to get people, you know, exposed that way so they can see what it's like. And some people fall in love with it. They get certified. Other people, it's, you know, 
we'll pass on it. But it's a way to expose the sport to uh, the public. Well, when you share a, something you have a passion for, that uh, you want to get better at, and that you want to do on a regular basis, and you find some people you want to do it with, then the bond grows. These are the kind of things that bring humanity together. We got enough dividing us. We have a few things like this that are uniting us, and that's what's most important. hardcover book wasn't printed in Los Angeles until 1881 and which is the same that same year a cookbook was printed in LA um, which also tells you something. My name is Suzanne Joskow and I'm an artist and I also uh, started the Los Angeles Community Cookbook Archive uh, which is started truly as just a personal collection and then started to grow merged with components of my art practice, which uh, often is archive and research-based, and now has expanded into a public archive where uh, online people can access uh, scanned copies of them in many circumstances, and I hope we'll cook from them. For a long time in my artwork, I've really been interested in place. Um, one of the avenues I've explored that in is through mapping. I will take a, a single point on what would be a traditional map and map that over time. So I, I often refer to that as a vertical mapping. This project itself is a kind of mapping because I've picked Los Angeles and I've picked a lens of uh, not just food but community cookbooks. Uh, but every single one of these cookbooks is tied to an organization that's really tied to a place in LA County. And so you get this kind of map or snapshot of LA that's also really tied to time. Almost every group in some way gathers at some point around food. And I think that's what makes cookbooks a kind of natural output for any group, regardless of what the initial interest is that's bringing them together. You know, when you read about these different groups, inevitably there's some sort of potluck that has happened for a meeting to discuss X, Y, or Z, um, and food is always there. Food is, is kind of this combination of a way of wel welcoming someone, you know, sharing a bit of yourself. And then what you, you also see in the cookbooks and in the organizations is food is a way of connecting with where you came from. For me, a big component of a community cookbook is collective authorship. For the most part, it's a group of individuals who've submitted recipes and they are not professional chefs. They are, um, they, they are hobbyist chefs and sharing this from their kitchen. So that things that are cooked in one person's kitchen can be cooked at home by someone else reading the book. These books really play on several levels because they are a testament to the organization who put them out. They are a record that this organization existed, in many cases who was part of it, what their mission was, often what they were raising money to try to do. They are then of course also a record of how people cooked and ate at the time. Um, so the recipes themselves are really fascinating look into a place and historical moment. This is the oldest book in the collection, How We Cook in Los Angeles. The first year of publication of hardcover books in LA, there was a publication of a cookbook, um, Los Angeles Cookery. This came soon after that. That was also put out by a women's church group. Um, but what I love about this book is in addition to all of the recipes, there's also essays throughout remembering different meals that they that they have had and also talking about ingredients from Los Angeles. You know, it's so moving and special to have individuals named in these in these cookbooks. But then, of course, sometimes, as is the case with uh, the Gay of Cooking cookbook, the contributors are not named. But, you know, this was a time where it would have been an, perhaps an unsafe thing to include the names of contributors. So the way that say it is a sort of a, a collective recipes, but you there is no attribution. And so that I think is, you know, an important contrast as well. In a way, the fact that there's an anonymity to this book re reflects a sense that there's an aspect of this community that, that cannot be public, cannot be published. In collecting these books, just truly it's like a personal ple pleasure at first, and then it grew into a bigger project. They were in a way very easy to collect because they are often in the bottom of the box at an estate sale. You know, I always felt like, oh no, but this is, someone spent a lot of time on this. This, this is something very precious about 
these as both objects and as sort of historical documents. Food isn't just a way to share about yourself, but it really is a way to commune with your past, with where you come, came from. Um, and I think, to me, that's what's so moving about cooking from these books, too, is that people I never met before, I can in, the w in some way share a meal with them over generations. It's not the same, but it is the same. It, 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 it in theory, tastes pretty much the same. Um, and so, I don't know, I think that's really special. How are you? Would you like, you want tea? I mean, it's right here, please. Well, I don't know, it's a, it's a little bit. Yeah, yeah same thank thing. you. Ham and eggs, ham and eggs. I like mine cooked good and brown. I like mine fried upside down. Ham and eggs, ham and eggs. Flip them, flop them, flip them, flop them. Ham and eggs. Member Randy Lakeman described the Breakfast Club as a prairie home companion as directed by David Lynch. I think it appeals to people who, number one, are a little quirky themselves. You know what kind of person is drawn to the Breakfast Club? How about this? The most unique and individual type of person. Well, because I think we don't take ourselves too seriously. I would also call it a mad tea party. The Los Angeles Breakfast Club is a 97-year-old, uh, historic now, a uh, community organization uh, based in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles. Uh, it was founded by a group of equestrians who met together on this very site every Wednesday morning uh, back in 1925. They would ride their horses through Griffith Park and they would gather together in the pre-dawn hours for breakfast. And uh, after doing that for a while, one of them came up with the idea, this should be a club. Every week we get together and we're all as weird as we want to be and nobody has any qualms with it. And we sing and we dance and we get out of our heads and we celebrate life. I think, you know, you've got people of different ages, people of different professions, none of that matters. Uh, we're just friends, we get along, we have an interest in history, we have an interest in Los Angeles, we have an interest in the world around us, and I think that is the cohesive part of our friendship. Since everybody there is just a little quirky, uh, they, they make no judgments. There are no judgments about people there. So that really highlights what the club is. It's a club of friendship, it's a club of acceptance, it's a club of let's just celebrate life and have fun. I think one of the things that many of us get from the Breakfast Club is a, a renewed sense of the importance of ritual. Sure, our rituals are silly, but silliness can be incredibly valuable. And what makes something sacred, I was once taught, is that it involves you making a sacrifice. And what we're sacrificing when we come to the Breakfast Club, other than a full night's sleep because we meet so gosh darn early, is uh, our ego, our sense of self-importance, our sense of control. You have no control when you are, uh, you know, sing when, you, when you're blindfolded and putting your hand in a plate of runny eggs uh, and being forced to sing in public. You don't have, uh, you know, your usual sense of control at that point. And so it, it takes the concepts of, again, hospitality, friendship, community, and it restores them to the sense of sacred. Uh, and it reminds us that the sacred can be really fun and really funny. Uh, so in a strange way, I think for some of us who are very non-denominational, the Breakfast Club has almost become our church. It's the church of friendship. Uh, there's a real sense of camaraderie. Um, the friendship really is what we emphasize. Um, you know, it, it's not just the rituals for the sake of rituals. Uh, we are really primarily, first and foremost, about the people. And the revival of this club that occurred basically starting around 2013 is so amazing to me. We never thought that it would make it. We were down to about 
10 active members that would come on a Wednesday morning and they knew the handwriting was on the wall. So enter Lily Holloman. How did you get to be president? Um, I had no choice. In 2015, uh, the pianist Don Snyder, who is the heart and soul of The Breakfast Club, and Carol Neese, who runs the Calisthenics, they are two of the OG members, as I like to call them. They um, stopped me in the parking lot and they said, you either become president right now or the club will close. So it was a tough choice, but I couldn't see the club closing. I just couldn't let it happen. The club has given me a sense of place in Los Angeles. I felt a bit untethered from the city before I had the club. And to have a place and a group of people that I see every single week is grounding. And it gives me a sense of support and a sense of safety. And it's a beautiful mirror for the places in which I could trust more. I could receive more love. I could give more love. It's, it's not only a happy place, it's a place that, if you let it, will hopefully deepen your experience as a person. Uh, it's a good connection in a very big city. A lot of people find their way here. And having lived here all my 72 years, I see dramatic changes in the city that make it a little less homey and friendly and a little more dog-eat-dog -dog than I think it used to be. And I like to think that uh, there's some young person out there that will be the third pianist of the Breakfast Club and will be enjoying the fact that they're just a hammer and egg every Wednesday morning. So I will leave you with C, C, C. C, 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 oh, why are you angry with me? Ever since I left over, I thought the boat would go over. Dear, oh dear, I have a queer sort of feeling in me. If I once reach the shore, I shall say au revoir to the sea. See, 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 see. Oh, why are you angry with me? Ever since I left over, I thought the boat would go over. Dear, oh dear, I have a queer sort of feeling in me. Once the shore, say au revoir to the sea, see, see. I was invited by the Library Foundation to be an artist in residence and to develop banners to commemorate seven different clubs or affinity groups. Um, what's been really wonderful about this project is that it's a really diverse range of ages, cultures, and, and geographies. And I think you get to see when you like look into the banners and the stories behind them, which will be captured in a zine, there's just a tremendous amount of like diversity and interest across LA that I think are really what make LA amazing. Celebrating things that might not necessarily uh, be celebrated in very public ways is a really wonderful way to bring human stories into the public light. Hi, my name is Lynn Nguyen. I am the Young Adult Librarian here at Chinatown Branch Library. So Teen Council is a community club uh, here at the library. We are a place that welcomes teens of all ages from all areas of the Los Angeles community to join and uh, share ideas together. The programs that we host is hosted by teens directly. And so we're really in charge of the things that we're interested in and want to teach others. And so because it's so teen-led, teen-based, um, that's how I feel included. 
a couple of us all brought up the idea. We were like, oh, we should do something too for the team's mental health and then for them to distress. And then later on, I said, oh, how about let's do a paint night? Because I hear uh, Miss Ling talk about uh, she actually did a paint night previously in other library. So we end up having our paint night in the uh, park in there, the newly built one. So it's a really memorable experience for me. It's the friendships and the bonds that are created outside of the Chinatown Teen Council that really make it special. It's an environment for teens specifically. I feel like we're all very understanding of each other and empathetic, so I think that's how we make it accepting. When the teens realize that y there's someone there that you know believes in them, they're, they have this confidence that just helps them you know, go out there and, and know that they could do anything that they set their mind to. The library in general, people perceive as the library as, as just a place that you can get books. Then there's another layer to that, which is the community aspect of it. Um, you, you cannot see that just by looking at the library or just by coming in. Um, you have to be involved in, in the programs. You have to come back to the programs. And the way that they come back is by providing the best possible service to them. We're in, we're in the business of serving people. That's, that's what it is. Uh, my name is Daryl Harville. Um, I, I came here today to tell my story um, and why I came to the, to the this is a tough one. Um, library. Library for help. I thought to go to the library would be the best thing I could ever do. I had a stroke in January 4th, 2016. It's about six years now. Um, that person that has a, has a stroke, they, they tend to say small. And this makes you good, big. When we put these people in the same classes and learn the same things and they understand they're all there for the same things, it works. And then when we put them in there with tutors that are like college professors, used to work at whatever the case may be, and they could learn from them and talk to them, they have that sense of, okay, community. They have that sense of, I belong here. They have, you know, different senses of, you know, okay, this, this works. I don't have to be embarrassed because I'm an adult that doesn't know how to do this. It doesn't matter. If you want to learn, just come and we'll figure something out for you. Because uh, I like to think that all we do really is, you know, we, we listen to them and say, what, what type of programs would you like us to have? And, and they tell us, well, I'm working on these skills. I need these skills for my job. I, I need to better my English skills, my interview skills for a job, uh, you name it. And so we listen to them, we create them, uh, and then they get together, really. You have to be part of somebody, group. Um, if not, you feel very lost, lost. So um, all these different people that have talked to me, talked to me, um, they made me important. They help me get us out a lot, and that's what makes it good. It's a confirmation. It's 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 something that I always uh, that I'm surprised about how together they are in this um, because they see each other, they see themselves on each other in each other. All those people that are out there that don't want to do anything, I think you think it's good to go out and do something about yourself. Um, even this little, little thing can turn out too big for yourself.